أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا محمد عبد الله ورسوله اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووفقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا اللهم بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا من فضلك علما وتعليما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا وأنت يا حي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم أعزنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا وأصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك ولا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين آمين آمين أما بعد My dear respected brothers and the audience that's following us on the live stream uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and I want to thank uh, Sheikh Yasin for his uh, kind and generous words of introduction may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless him and uh, raise his maqam in the dunya and the akhirah um, and I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight uh, for this program. It's a, a blessed occasion. It's a blessed time. Today is the first day of uh, Rabil Anwar, Rabil Awal. Tonight is the second night of this blessed month. And by the blessed coincidence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed us this year that uh, Rabil Awal started its first night was Laylatul Jum'ah last night. So the blessings are multiplied and we pray Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this entire month a time of great blessings for us. I also want to convey uh, special salams from our Grand Sheikh, Sayyidina Sheikh. Uh, he he requested me to convey salams to all the brothers and sisters, uh, all the murids and the Muslim community for all the different locations where we're going. So special salams to you. He recently returned uh, from a trip to Singapore, uh, which was very successful. And the response of the community there was tremendous. Um, and also there were uh, more openings, futuhat, that he received from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, especially uh, he was blessed to uh, compose several unique and amazing poems in honor of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And uh, these would be released soon enough, inshallah, on this occasion of Rabil Anwar and the Mawlid of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. A couple of weeks ago, last, last month, October, uh, I visited uh, Italy as part of an interfaith delegation that went to visit the Vatican and to meet with uh, the Pope. So we had meetings with the Pope and with several senior officials of the Vatican and The main reason I'm mentioning this is that my realization is that we have to do so much work. Um, we may think that we're doing a lot, but after I went and I visited the Vatican and see what they're doing, uh, I realized that we really have to do much more. And one example of this is uh, they have a department 
uh, for Arabic and Islamic studies, the Vatican, and they have a university, a full-fledged university for Arabic and Islamic studies, not a department, but a full-fledged university. That's the only thing they study in that university. It's called the Pontifical University for Arabic and Islamic studies. And they have students from many parts of the world. Uh, the Catholic Church in different countries would select students, candidates, and send them there. And all the students are on scholarship. Everything is paid for. And students would uh, do their masters. So they already have to complete a bachelor's degree from their home country. They go there, they do their masters and PhD. Some of the students are selected for that. This year, there are 10 students doing their PhD. What is amazing and interesting is that the studies are in Arabic language. So the first year, the student will spend studying Arabic so that they can uh, listen to lectures in Arabic. They can study uh, the traditional text in Arabic and write their thesis in Arabic. It's amazing. They're not Muslims. They're Catholic. But it shows their dedication. So we asked them, why you do this? They said that uh, we have to engage a Muslim community. They recognize that the Muslim Ummah is the largest non-Christian group in the world. And so they have a ministry for interreligious dialogue, for example. And most of their activity is concentrated on Muslim relationships. I met a minister of that ministry, Bishop Miguel Aluso, and he speaks fluent Arabic. He's a scholar of Islam, even though he's a Catholic bishop. He graduated from that same university I mentioned many years ago, and he, his last position, he was the rector of that university. Now he's a minister of interreligious dialogue. So there's a lot of focus on Islam. And they're so dedicated that they spend time learning Arabic and studying Islam at such a high level. It reminded me many years ago in, in the late 1970s when I went to Mecca to study at Umm Al-Qur University. The first th thing I had to do was to study Arabic because the, the, the university, the medium of instruction is Arabic. Uh, but I was doing that because I'm a Muslim. I want to know Islam so I can teach others about Islam. They're not Muslims, but they have that dedication. And the focus of the thesis that they do, whether it's a master's uh, degree or PhD degree, is that they, they would take a traditional Islamic text which has not been translated and they translate it and do a commentary on that. And there, there are books they talk about that, uh, you know, on a, on a first name basis. They're so familiar with it. Tafsir al Manar, the students, he's doing this. This other text, that other, and they know the scholars and so on. It's amazing. You, you would think that you are in an Islamic university with Muslim scholars. Here they are, and they're doing this. I, I never knew they had such a university dedicated only to Islamic studies. And the realization is that we have to do much more work to strengthen our ummah, to promote the well-being of our ummah. And for us now to see our tariqah as this vehicle to achieve that. The vehicle we travel upon, all of us together, to achieve those noble objectives. Ultimately, to go to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The tariqah is that vehicle. 
And I also want to tell you that sometimes when we're traveling on this vehicle, some people may fall off or jump off or step off, but that should not uh, cause you to question your journey. That you want to be, you want to be on this vehicle and to travel on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is our tariqah. The Shahdali tariqah has many unique attributes. I usually tell, especially the younger brothers and sisters, or younger brothers, that it's the Cadillac of Tarikas. It's an expression, those of you who are into cars, you would, you would recognize that. It's a special Tarika. It's described as Tarika to ilm al ulama. It is the Tarika of the ulama. Is described as tariqa to dhikr wal mudhakara. This mudhakara that you engage in. And so you should feel, we should all feel honored that we are part of this shadali tariqa. And, and sometimes, sometimes, it, it happens that there are ups and downs in anything in life. Not all relationships are smooth all the time. There are, there are ups and downs. Even the relationship of a husband and wife, sometimes there are problems relationship between parents and children. Sometimes there may be problems. But we should always strive to resolve our problems, uh, try to uh, stick together. One of the, one of the things that Imam Shadri, radiallahu anhu, he would tell the Murids that part of the conditions of our bayah is that we promise on the Day of Judgment whoever is safe and secure on the Sirat should take their fellow Murids with them. This is the relationship he wants from us. And we should always remind ourselves of this. And even though there are times we may be tested, shaitan is busy, there are times we may be tested uh, in our relationships, you always want to seek opportunities to mend those relationships. So as a tariqa, we can be one family. Be one family. And always strive to remain together, get back together, always strive to build our relationships, strengthen our relationships for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something that uh, we should be mindful of. Tonight I want to share some reflections on one item from a special salawat. It's called Salat al mashishiya In September, uh, some of you uh, went to a retreat in Morocco, in the city of Tatwan. And it was organized uh, near to the maqam of Sayyidina Abdul Salam ibn Mashish, radiallahu anhu. 
he is important because he is the Sheikh of Sayyidina Imam Abu Hassan al Shadili radiallahu anhu. And the only surviving writing from him is this special salawat, a salat al mashishiyya Some scholars consider this to be the most outstanding salawat. And to give you an idea of how this salawat, this salat al mashishiyya is regarded, it is the salawat of choice for the sheikhs of Al-Azhar al-Sharif. When you look to the biography of the grand sheikhs of Al-Azhar, including there is their attachment to this salat al mashishiyya Some of them are described as Ahlul Qur'an, that is, spend all their time with Qur'an. And whatever little time they have, other than that, they are spending it in a Salat al mashishiyya Towards the end of this Salawat, his Salat al mashishiyya the Imam says that we should recite an ayah from the Qur'an three times. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmatan lana min amrina rashada. And there's an important concept that, that's contained in this ayah that I want to reflect or share a, re a few reflections upon tonight. And that's the concept of rushd. lana min amrina rashada. Rabbana atina min ladunka rahmatan. Ya Allah, bestow your mercy upon me. But it is a special type of mercy in this dua. Min ladunka. Min ladunka. If the ayah had read, Atina min indika, it's, it has the same meaning, give me your mercy. But it, when, when the word ladunka is used, it has a special connotation. I want to give an example to illustrate this. How many of you went for Hajj or Umrah? Raise your hands. Have you gone for Hajj and Umrah? Okay. A good number, alhamdulillah. May Allah bless all of us to go for Hajj and Umrah. Time and time, more and more. When people go for Hajj, one of the things they do, or Umrah, one of the things they do when they're coming back, they want to buy gifts for family members, relatives, friends, and so on. But there are different types of gifts. You go to the souk, and you have some attar. You go to Sheikh Khalid al Afghani for attar. And then have some cheap ones, five riyals and so on. It says, give me 50 of those. Right? And then some special ones now, 100 riyals, 200 riyals, one of this, two of this. Special attar. You go to the souk. Some test may be 10 reals a dozen, give me 10 dozen. And then some special ones now, 100 reals, 200 reals. So you get one of this, two of this. So you come back home, Birmingham. The cheap attar, test be beads, sajada, it's in the living room there. Everyone can see, because you're going to get guests coming to you. You just came back from Hajj, right? The Sunnah, to visit someone who comes back from Hajj. Sunnah of the Ummah, and to ask them to make dua for you, because that's the time when dua is accepted. They just came from Hajj, they're pure, forgiven. The other expensive ones, it's in the bedroom. 
there. So, the regular guests come, give them some, some, some water, some dates, the attire in the living room, right? Give them this. But then some special person come now, someone who's special to you. You're not giving from that collection of gifts. You go into the bedroom, bring out the expensive ones, and this is what you're giving to them as a gift. So, min hindika rahma refers to the regular, the regular mercies. Min ladunka rahma refers to the secret treasures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Atina min ladunka rahma. That is the rahma I want from you, Ya Allah. Your special mercies. Special mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. lana min amrina rashid. And bless us in our fears with rushd. Grant us rushd in all our affairs. This concept of rushd, so important. When Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam wanted to accompany Sayyidina Khidr alayhi salam, what was his request? What he wanted from Sayyidina Khidr? Hal attabi'uka ala an tu'allimani mimma ulimta rushda? Would you permit me to follow you, to be with you, so that you can teach me rushd? Now, this is Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. Ulul azmi min rusul He is not only a prophet, he is not only a messenger, he is from among the great messengers, Sayyidina Musa alayhi salam. And he is following Sayyidina Khidir, who is not at that level, that maqam, and he's begging him, teach me rushd. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him rushd. Sayyidina Khidir, Taj Sir, the crown of all secrets. So rushd is what he asked for. And so this is a great blessing for us to have in our lives. Rushd, this concept of being rightly guided in everything. Rightly guided in our words, what we say. Rightly guided in our actions, what we do. Rightly guided in our thoughts, what we think. Rightly guided with our feelings in our hearts. Everything. Rushed. It's an amazing blessing to have. There are times when, you know, you say something. And the moment you say it, you, you regret. Oh, I should not have said that. You, 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 you say something to your parents. And you realize, uh, that's disrespectful. I should not have said that. No matter what they did, shouldn't have said that. I wish I can take back those words. But it's already out there in public domain. Something you said to your spouse. And they realize, no, I should not have said that. Words. Most relationships are ruptured by the words we say. You can spend 10, 15 years building a relationship with someone. And then in 30 seconds, you can say something terrible that breaks that relationship. that it will never be the same again. SubhanAllah. But when you have rushed, you're guided in what you say. The Prophet ﷺ was the pinnacle of this. He would never say something of himself, of his own volition. It is but revelation inspired to him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rushd. Sometimes you do something 
and realize uh, I should not have done that. And oftentimes, it's not deliberate. Like you didn't plan to do this. It just happened. You did it and then you realize, no, I should not have done it. If only I can take it back. When you have rushed, you do what is right. You do things that you're pleased with and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. This concept of rushed. And so among the power dua in the Quran is this ayah. رَبْنَا آتِنَا مِنْ دُونْكَ رَحْمَةً وَهَيِّئْ لَنَا مِنْ أَمْوِنَا رَشَدًا It's something that we should always be begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for. Just guide us in everything. Because we don't, we don't know much. Yeah. We don't know much. We, we beg Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this tawfiq in everything we do. And if he doesn't grant us that, we are astray. As Imam Ibn Attaq, Allah Sakandri said, everyone is misguided except who you guide, O oh Allah. Everyone is misguided except whom you guide, O oh Allah. The guidance is only from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, rushed in our lives that we need to be mindful of. And the Quran has so many examples of this concept of rushed. And tonight I, I want to share with you a few things you can do to be blessed with rushed in your life. Different manifestations of rushed. The first is Sa'ada. Rushed leads to Sa'ada. Sa'ada fi darain. Happiness in this dunya and in the akhirah. And the scholars have mentioned that the way to achieve the sa'ada fi darain is salah or ritual prayer. Salah leads to the sa'ada in the dunya and in the akhirah. Happiness. Sa'ada is an outcome of rushed when you have rushed in your life. So, what I want to tell you tonight is you look at yourself, see where you are with respect to your salah and try to improve it one step better. If we're doing our five fard salah, if that's where we are, then the next level is wajib. What is wajib in our salah? Salat al witr for example. We want to do that. If we're doing that, then the next step is sunnah mu'akkadah. What are the sunnahs that we, we, we must, must be mindful of? For example, the two uh, rakat sunnah of fajr, the two rakat sunnah of maghrib. The Prophet sallallahu would never miss it. We never miss it. Even when he was traveling, he would always do it. So, that's the next level. If you're doing that, then sunnah ghayb mu'akkada. Among which, for example, the four rakat of, of sunnah uh, before asr. But scholars have mentioned that this, this four rakat grants you an opening to the heavens, that blessings flow in your life when you do these four rakat regularly. They have their benefit. The attitude, the mindset of the Sahabas was that if the Prophet did it, it's important. They would do it. Then if that's where you are, 
where you are in your salah, nawafil. You do that. If you're at that level, then tahajjud, qiyam. So wherever you are, take it a step higher. in what you're doing with your salah. And secondly, how, the how of your salah. There is the what of your salah, what you're doing, do, do some more. And if, if you think that you're doing too much, sometimes we, we feel this way, we're doing a lot of salah. Then you look to the believers before us. Look to the Sahabas. Sayyidina Abu Huraira, his daughter said that in their home, throughout the night, there was someone doing qiyam. Tahajjud. She said she would take one third of the night, her mother would take one third of the night, her father, Sayyidina Abu Hayra, would take one third of the night. So throughout the night, someone is awake in their home doing Qiyam. She said when her mother passed away, she took half of the night and her father would take half of the night. So there's someone always in Salah. So when we, when we think about this, we realize that well, we can do some more. And then the how of our salah. We want to improve the quality of our salah. This khushu'a in our salah. Look at hudur al-qalb, the presence of the, our heart in our salah. You always want to try to improve on that. As I said, no matter where you are, I look around here, Sheikh Yasin, and I can see angels here. These brothers are very pious. I can see that nowhere in your faces. But what I'm saying is that no matter where you are now, you want to try to be better. And the inspiration for that, look to the previous believers. When we, when we read the biography of, or we study the biography of the great Imams and so on, their regular routine was 100 rakat nafil every day, 200 rakat, 300 rakat every day. They would find time to do that. And that's just one of the things they did. So when we know this, we, we feel inspired to do more. And then equality, hudur al-qalb, presence of heart in the salah and taslim al-jawarih, submission of all our limbs and organs in our salah. <coughs> Imam al-Fudayl, he used to say that One of his greatest de desires is to do two rakat of salah in full, total, com complete submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because it's difficult. He used to say that it's easy to start our salah with the right frame of mind, presence of heart. But during that ibad, it's difficult to maintain it. Because everything is coming at us. So the striving from all of us, the more you strive to improve that quality in your salah, the more you're blessed with rushd in your life. And the scholar said this leads to sa'ada. The second thing is siyam, fasting. This is one of the one of the techniques that especially Ahlu Tasawwuf, the people of Tasawwuf, would use to progress on this journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the minimum is 
the fast of Ramadan, it's fard. But let that not be the only fasting we do in the year. We strive, we do that. But then, the Prophet ﷺ established certain techniques of what we do with our fasting to help us on this journey. So there's the monthly sunnah, 13, 14, 15 of the Islamic month. There's the weekly sunnah, Mondays and Thursdays, and all the special days, the fast of Muharram and so on, 10th of Muharram, the day before, the day after, and so on. So we, we should make use of this opportunity. And I think now, in this month of Rabil Awal, to start with Monday fasting. Just one day a week. Why? Because the Prophet ﷺ, he used to fast on Mondays. And the Sahabas, they asked him, Ya Rasulullah, why you fast on Monday? And he said, I was born on a Monday, so I fast on a Monday. They give thanks to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I'm saying it's good to start with that now in Rabi'l Awal because this is the month of the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi So it's a way to celebrate the birth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi because this is what he did. He celebrated his birth by fasting on the day of his birth. But rather than celebrating that birthday once a year, he did it once a week. Fast. And the Sahabas celebrated his birthday by fasting on Monday. They followed, it's a sunnah, so they followed the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu fasting on Monday. The awliya, they did that. And throughout these 14 centuries, believers have done that. Even today, in our times, I'm sure you know of people who fast on Mondays. The reason for it, the Prophet Sallallahu did it recognizing the day of his birth. And this hadith is in Sahih Muslim, among others, where he mentioned this. So this may be a good opportunity for us to start and then continue after Rabi al -Awwal. And so look to fasting as a way to enhance our progress on this spiritual journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And also in this Technique to attract rushd in your life. Be mindful of the how of our fast, the quality of our fast. Imam Al Ghazali mentions three levels of fasting: the ordinary level, the extraordinary, extraordinary level, the fasting of the elite, the special level. The ordinary level, you follow, you observe the fiqh rules, which is imsak, abstention from dawn to dusk. And the extraordinary level, the fasting of the limbs of our body. Fasting of the eyes, see only what pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fasting of the ear, listen to only what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The fasting of the tongue, speak only what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's the second level. And then he said the third level is the fasting of the heart. That this heart is feeling only what is pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he said this is the fast of the Anbiya and Mursali. So, here also we strive to improve what we are doing. And what it leads to, the scholar says, siha. It leads, it, it grants you health in your life. It attracts this special blessings of siha, of being healthy in our lives. Fasting does that, makes you healthy. There's this connection between our ibadah and our well-being in life. And I want you to recognize this connection because then it adds another purpose behind your ibadah. 
and, and it strengthens that connection between us and our ibadah. The ibad is no, it's no longer pointless. It's no longer something we do just because we have to do it. Because when you, when you think like that, when, when people think like that, they just do this ibadah because they have to do it, uh, then they start seeking the easiest way out. Like Juma. Juma. People who think like this, Juma for them every Friday is uh, an opportunity to get a nap during the day. Go to the masjid during the khutbah, you take a nap. And, but because you can just tell yourself, oh, I, I attend Juma. For some other people, they, they notice when the Imam usually would finish the khutbah, when he would start his salah. So they plan to come in at that time. Only so they can pray and they say, say to themselves, I did Juma. When you, know, you only do the ibadah because you have to do it, this is what happens. This is what it leads to. But now I want, I want us to have this deliberate purpose for our acts of worship. It has a role, a purpose, a function in our lives. So, so siyam leads to health, spiritual health, physical health, mental health. It gives you all of that. And now wherever you are with your siyam, you want to take it a step higher. One step at a time. One little step at a time. The third manifestation or the third way to attract rushd in your life is through istighfar. Istighfar. One of the one of the benefits or consequence of istighfar is that it grants you an opening from the difficulties in your life. It grants you a solution to the difficulties in your life. It takes you out of difficult situations in your life brings ease to you. And this is what Rushd achieve for you in your life. Imam Hassan al-Basri, radiallahu anhu, Imam al-Tabi'een. People would come to him with their problems. And invariably, he would tell them, do istighfar. There's an incident. One tribe, Kabila in particular, came to him. And they said that they're not able to harvest their crops. They plant their crop, it grows. But before the time of harvest, the crop is destroyed. Something happened. Weather conditions, too much rain or whatever, insects and other things. They, they're not able to harvest their crops. He told them, do istighfar. They came back again on another occasion. They said that the women in the tribe are not able to carry successful pregnancy. They get pregnant, but before the time of delivery, nine months after, sometime then they lose that baby, miscarriage, and so on. This is happening to them. He told them, do istighfar. 
They came in another occasion and said that they're suffering from drought. They didn't get rain for a long time. He said, do you stay far? And they said, yeah, Imam. We came to you for all these difficult problems. And all you can tell us to do is to say, Astaghfirullah. Give us something better. He said, do you not read the book of Allah? فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ غَفَّارًا يُرْسِلِ السَّمَاءَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِدْرَارًا وَيُمْدِدُكُمْ بِأَمْوَالٍ وَبَنِينَ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا الله أكبر فَقُلْتُ اسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ Seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and all those things would flow in your lives, all those things. The ayah we recite in our weird alam, the ayah of istighfar, وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُوَ خَيْرٌ وَأَعْظَمَ أَجْرًا وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورُ رَحِيمٌ وَاسْتَغْفِرُ اللَّهِ The command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do istighfar. This verb here, wastaghfirullah, istaghfirullah, it's fil amr in the Arabic grammar. It's the command form of the verb. We are lost one is commanding us to do istighfar. But it's mentioned here also. The effect of istighfar on our good deeds. Whatever good you do, you will find it with Allah. And you will find it better than that. People, subhanAllah, believers would be surprised on the day of judgment when they see, or in Jannah, when they see rewards they're receiving. And they said, what did I do to deserve, to deserve this? They, they can't remember doing anything to deserve those special blessings. تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ هُوَ خَيْرًا وَأَعْظَمَ أَجْرًا You'll find these special blessings from because of istighfar, istighfar, istighfar. And so we, we do it a hundred times in the morning, a hundred times in the evening, that's minimum. But you should try to do more of that. More of this Istighfar. A hundred times in the morning, weird alarm, a hundred times in the evening. But you want to do more of that. Many times when we are in the presence of great awliya, they're sitting down, tasbih bead, astaghfirullah, 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 all the time. And their entire life is devoted to Allah. They spend their time teaching people about Islam, studying, doing research about Islam, doing ibadah. All their days occupied like that. Still, they're doing istighfar. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. Because the istighfar you do is not only to gain forgiveness from a sin you committed. That's actually the lowest level of istighfar. Because these people, they're not, they don't have time to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. All the time, they're actively spending and obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But the istighfar you do elevates you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It elevates you closer and closer to Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves when we beg Him for forgiveness. He loves that. The Prophet mentioned several hadith about this. There's one hadith that you all know of this man traveling in the desert and he stopped to rest. He wakes up, his camel has disappeared with his water supply, food and so on. He's in the desert. That's the means of his survival. He starts searching. He cannot find his camel. And so he Lives are now to die. He's given up all hope of living. And then he wakes up again 
and he finds this coming in front of him. The prophet said, how happy would this person be when he sees his camel now in front of him? Because this is his lease, a new lease on life. And then the prophet said, when one of you commit a sin and turn to Allah for forgiveness, begging him for forgiveness, he is more happy with you than the happiness of that person. And this is with a person who commits a sin. What about a believer who doesn't commit a sin but still is begging Allah SWT for forgiveness? Ya Allah, forgive me. Imagine. And, and the, the other thing about the how of this istighfar now is to actively pursue this forgiveness from Allah SWT. And this is the linguistic implication of the expression, the word, astaghfirullah. The, the, the scene, the second letter of this word, the first letter is alif, scene, astaghfirullah. The scene is called by the grammarians as scene at talab, the scene of seeking. Do you actively seek the forgiveness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? You're begging Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this forgiveness. As you recite, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. Tears flow from the eyes, from the heart. The quality of that is thick far. And you do this. So this is thick far leads to faraj. <clears throat> the openings, a way out of every difficulty. So this is another manifestation of rushed. Because rushed leads you to a solution for every difficulty in your life when you have that blessing of rushed. These are a few things that I, I want to conclude. There are several of them, but I'll just conclude with one final one, which is actually the culmination <clears throat> of these manifestations of rushed in our life. And that is how to achieve the goodness of the dunya <clears throat> and the goodness of the akhir. How to achieve the goodness in the dunya and the goodness in the akhir. To get rid of all the concerns of the dunya and the anxieties of the akhir. <coughs> Sheikh Yasin, he did a, uh, the brother sent me, um, I think maybe last week, Sheikh Yassin did a promo for the One Million Salawat event. And he mentioned a hadith that states this. The same concept I'm talking about now. Of that person who came to the Prophet asking how much salawat he should do. And what the Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So, the way to achieve the goodness of the dunya and the goodness of the akhirah is through salawat. The scholars have said, Miftahu al khair kullahu as salatu was salamu ala nabi. The key to all goodness in the dunya and in the akhirah is salawat on the Prophet. The key to all goodness. This is the ultimate manifestation of rushd in your life. Grant me rushed in my life. How do you attract that rushed? These are the techniques here. The final one, salawat. To recite salawat, darud sharif, on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.
many times when you meet uh, these great awliya and especially in the late years of their life they all they know they'll pass away many of them they're only reciting salawat all their time spent with salawat no other vicar matters now I want you to think about this because that's a time now when they've done whatever they wanted to do regarding the dunya. That's a time when they're preparing to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're old in their 80s, 90s and so on. It's only a matter of time before they leave the dunya. They know this. And the choice they make is to recite salawat all the time. Because they know the benefit of this. One outstanding example is from the city, Birmingham. The founder of Gamkol Sharif Masjid, Sufi Abdullah. You know him, he passed away a couple of years ago. He was so happy at this one million salawat project we would have. And he would take huge numbers, 100,000, 200,000, 300,000 to recite for this project. We would, we would take pledges from people. Half a million, he would do, because that's what he, he does all the time, not only Rabi al -Awwal. I I want you to consider this because that's a time when it's like Allah subhanahu wa says about the Akhirah, wa basa rukal yawma hadid. That's in the, the Akhirah. But some believers are blessed with that basira in the dunya. What it means is that uh, you're able to cut to the chase. I don't know if you know that expression here in the UK. You, you have that expression here? Cut to the chase? We have it in Canada. You know what that means? That you don't bother with any irrelevant things. You just go directly to what you want. And that's one of the blessings of Rushd. That you can remove the distractions from your life. If you can do that, if you can really focus on what you set out to achieve, you would achieve it. But most times people don't achieve what they want to in life because they allow distractions to affect that pursuit. And the Prophet Sallallahu described this as the quality of the strong believer, al-mu'min al qawiyyu in that hadith. He says, Ihris alama yanfawka, wasta'in billahi, wala ta'ajaz. Focus on what is of benefit for you. You want to achieve something in life, focus on it. Put aside every other thing. You want to become a doctor, you have to study hard. You want to become an engineer, you have to study hard. You want to become a pharmacist, IT, whatever career it is. You have to focus on that to achieve it. If you don't, if you, know, you spend one hour doing it and then the next hour you want to go out with the friends and hang out and have a nice time, then you wouldn't achieve it. You have to give up certain things in life to achieve what really matters. Focus on what is of use to you. <laughs> so these awliya, when you know, they, there's that strong conviction in their heart that they're going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They know this. I'm going back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I have to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the decision they take, invariably, prepare by reciting salawat. Prepare for that return. Prepare for that meeting. <clears throat> prepare for every maqam in the remaining journey of your life with salawat. The maqam of the grave, the barzakh, prepare for that with salawat. The maqam of resurrection, prepare for that with salawat. The maqam for judgment, prepare for that with salawat. The maqam in the akhirah to go over the sirat, prepare for that with salawat. And so that's what they busy themselves with. Salawat attracts rushd in your life, in everything you do. 
I want us to remember this and live it. And so in conclusion, tonight we talked about uh, this ayah uh, from the Salat al-Mashishi of uh, Sayyidina Abdul Salam ibn Mashish uh, and some of the ways to attract rushd in our lives, how we should do that. And may Allah SWT bless us with rushd and grant us rushd in every aspect of our life and grant us all the goodness of the dunya and all the goodness of the akhirah. May Allah SWT accept all our dua. May Allah SWT grant us shifa, anyone who is ill, and our family members, our loved ones. May Allah SWT grant them shifa. May Allah SWT bless all of us with mahabba for him and mahabba for the Prophet SallAllahu Alaihi Wasallam. May Allah SWT bless all of us to be with Rasulullah SallAllahu to be with Ahlul Bayt, to be with the Sahabas, to be with Awliya in Jannah al Firdaus in the Akhirah. Amin, Amin, Amin. Wa sallallahu ta'ala ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa ashabi ajma'in wa akhirahu alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.